Hey, hey, thanks for tuning in to the All About Dogs podcast. I'm Anthony. I'll be your host, and let's get right into it. Hey, 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 everyone. Uh, thanks for tuning into the show. This is officially episode number one. So um, I'm a little nervous. Uh, so this is totally put the show together all myself. Um, I would definitely call it a, sh- uh, a show on a budget. <laughs> but uh, uh, this is uh, the first episode. I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm very excited about kind of getting this show going. Um, I got so much information I kind of just want to get out there and it's been all bottled up in me a little bit actually just because I haven't been doing a uh, pushing a whole lot of content online in the last few years so I'm really excited to to be here Um, and as you probably know by the title of the show um, this is a little bit about me and how I got into dog training and I just thought I would share that with you guys. I I used to share that every time I met a new client, but I've more or less gotten away from it over the years. I also used to do uh, these little dog obedience demonstrations for the clients as well, and I'm not really doing that much either anymore. I'm more or less just kind of getting in there and getting to the point, trying to find out what their goals are with training and uh, just talk about how I can help them, right? So pretty direct, pretty to the point. Uh, don't want to bore them uh, with you know my story and that kind of thing some people are interested and they'll ask and others won't so much so this is uh definitely the story about how I got involved in dog training and the journey I've taken and pretty much more or less where I am right now with it and the story starts with the two that I have right behind me. (laughs) So uh, Peanut, he's the brown dog, and Oreo is the brindle. And, you know, uh, I I had them as young puppies, and more or less the the, the story starts with me acquiring them as young puppies. And, and, you know, had the wife, had the two kids, and was pretty much more or less trying to just live that, typical uh, stereotype in terms of having a family and the family having a pet, right? So, of course, we chose dogs, and I acquired Oreo through the Humane Society. Um, We went down and just adopted her. Young, sweet, shy little thing. Um, And then Peanut I acquired from a co-worker at the time uh, that could no longer keep him because he was moving into some apartments where he couldn't take the dog and um, that's how I ended up with the two dogs together they were both under a year at the time and things were well you know we had a um, a nice little house and it had a yard and but the problem with the yard and kind of how this all begins is it was a chain link fence uh, in a dirt yard and what was happening as the darks got a little bit older, they started to like, started to try escaping and stuff like that, right? And I heard that was like a pretty, like well-documented thing with intact males. And so what was happening is they would dig out underneath or they would pull the fence up, the chain link fence up with their teeth and they would, you know, sneak out underneath. And it just so happens in the neighborhood that I was living in, the the neighbors and that kind of thing, they were scared of the dogs. Of course, they're pit bull type looking dogs. And um, they come knocking on my door saying, hey, you need to keep your dogs um, contained. You know, that we're worried about our children's safety. All the typical, uh, stereotypical pit bull type concerns, right? Lay down, bud. And so, um, 
sorry, my dog is uh, getting up and readjusting that kind of thing. He interrupted my flow. Well, anyways, they were they were run digging out uh, uh, digging out underneath the fence, running around in the neighborhood, and um, my neighbors were bringing the attention to me. And my next door neighbor was really sweet about uh, uh, gathering them up and holding on to them until I got home from work. Because at the time, um, you know, text messaging and that thing, the cell phones were just really starting to hit the mainstream thing, and we weren't necessarily sharing our our phone numbers with all of our neighbors and that kind of thing, right? So it wasn't a situation where I was at work and I would get a text message or anything like that. Basically, I would get home from work and my dogs wouldn't be there. I'd go looking for them. My neighbor would see me walking and she would um, come out and and uh, let me know she had my dogs, right? And so this happened a few times and I was starting to get a little... Of course I cared and I was trying to prevent them from getting out and it was essentially a game of cat and mouse like I would uh, I'd bend the the chain link fence I'd bend it back into place right stretch it back out um, I would uh, I even got to the point where I would like dig a, a little trench right at the fence line and fill it with concrete and literally uh, stick the chain link fence into the concrete and let it dry right so that they couldn't pull it up um, but interestingly enough you know they'd find another way out and unfortunately one day they got out this luckily it was on a weekend and I was home but they got out one day and ran started running the neighborhood fence fighting with the neighborhood dogs and somehow or another ended up inside of one of the neighbor's yards with their boxer and gotten into a fight, right? So this is where it all more or less gets started. And the neighbor, you know, it, it was a Saturday morning. I had just gotten, I, I was just waking up. I let them outside to potty them, jumped in the shower. And by the time I was getting out of the shower, this, this individual was already knocking on my door. And he was incredibly distraught, shaken up. You could see he was a little traumatized. And his voice was cracking, and he was trying to tell me that my dogs got into his yard, double teamed his dog, and his dog was in the vehicle because he was parked at, out in front of my house, right? He was on his way to the vet. He wanted to let me know that, you know, he fought my dogs off of his dog. He was on the way to the vet. And of course, you know, that was really unsettling. So didn't take me long to find my dogs. They were like right around the corner, actually. They were still running around. Gathered them up. And a few hours later, went down to the individual's house. Offered to reimburse him for his vet fees, you know, because I was genuinely concerned. And I, and I was doing everything I could at the time to, to prevent them from getting out, but they would just find another way out, right? And so, um, so of you know, pay the vet bills, but what happened is, unknown, unbeknownst to me, they called Animal Control, and Animal Control came out uh, and actually just gave me a, a citation, right, for like, I think the tags weren't up to date and I got cited for off leash because the dogs were not on the leash, right? And so when the um, when the uh, owners of the other dog found out that animal control did not uh, take um, my dogs away from me and euthanize them, they became incredibly upset. And and they called back down to animal control they um, raised a big fuss, and this caused animal control to do a dangerous dog investigation. So once I got, once they came down and kind of, once animal control came down to let me know that they were going to be doing this investigation, um, I right away I got on the got on the internet and started trying to find a couple of dog trainers, and and I did just that actually. I found a, a couple of dog trainers. And one of them was a little bit into the 
hardcore obedience thing and the other one was like let me bring my dog over to meet your dog and we'll see if you have an aggression problem right because i was concerned that they were aggressive i didn't know they they weren't around other dogs i had never taken them to the dog park right so when that trainer brought their dog oh man i was crazy nervous right uh and I was holding onto the leash, tense, heart racing a million miles an hour. All the typical things, you know, that comes with nervous and anxious and the sweating and the whole nine yards. And sure enough, like nothing happened, right? My dogs didn't uh, try to bite her dog. And um, I was like, whoa. <laughs> and at this time, like... Uh, uh, the dog whisperer was like starting to really take off, right? It was really popular on TV, and so, um, and so I guess they were following that model more or less. At the at the at the specific time that trainer came over, I had I knew nothing about the about the show, but you know, so I was relieved to find out my dogs weren't aggressive. But when it and and I hired both trainers, right? And so with one trainer, I started taking the obedience approach, and with the other trainer. Um, I started getting out to like the dog park and that kind of thing. And I was taking them out to the dog parks and became a regular dog park guy. Um, so what ended up happening is the animal control came back and only labeled uh, peanut uh, dangerous, but not Oreo. And I think that's, of course, of uh, because of how he looks. And... Um, they gave me a couple of options, right? They were like, you can do yada, 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 tattoo him, muzzle him anytime he's off the property, do this, this, and that to your yard. And and, and after, after having the experience that I was having with the trainers, I didn't feel like this uh, label was appropriate. And so... Um, they said I they, so they gave me the options of following those instructions, um, surrendering the dog, or appealing it uh, to a dangerous dog hearing. And so ultimately that's what I did. I appealed it and more or less played my own like doggy lawyer. Um, started like first and foremost, I had the two trainers as witnesses. They both kind of came down and testified on my behalf. It was this dangerous dog investigation thing was doggy court without a real judge. It was like a third-party vendor for the the uh, the county the, for the Pima Animal Control, and so. Um, but I think uh, I'm pretty proud of this part actually because I gathered up. I played my own lawyer. I gathered up like all this evidence. Um, I I started uh, taking my dogs to dog parks and recording them in the dog park, playing with other dogs. Um, started sharing my story with people in the dog park and got them to write letters on my behalf of about their experience with my dogs right so you got if you couple the letters with the video and then having the two uh professional dog trainers show up with me i more or less overwhelmed them with evidence and um had the label the dangerous dog label overturned and when I got this label overturned, I was still working with this obedience trainer primarily. And at the time, this was like 08, 09, the economy was crashing. I was actually out of work. And the, uh, the trainer was really good about kind of just empowering me and uh, uh, making me feel good about what I was doing, right? And this really, I was unemployed. I knew what they were charging me. And... I started to think to myself, hey, could you actually make a, a living as a dog trainer? And so I, I asked the, the dog trainer, I was like, hey, can you, can you make a living at this? And they were really helpful in the sense they were like, yes, you can make a living. You're welcome to shadow me if you would like. Um, and you should check out this dog training school. And so sure enough, jumped on the opportunity right was super excited um and 
the nice thing about the shadowing program is I wasn't necessarily earning any money, but I was getting like all this hands-on experience. I was going into all of my dog trainers' clients' houses and uh, and working with dogs hands-on, right? And the trainer was great about like l- letting me figure it out. And um, eventually ended up enrolling at the dog training school. Um, matter of fact, um, it's the school, uh, it's called National Canine, uh, National Canine School for Dog Trainers, right? And it's out in Columbus, Ohio. And they had this like six weeks uh, master trainer course. And jumped on that opportunity, went out there for six weeks, left my, my wife, my kids, the two dogs, <laughs> um, went out there and um, got immersed into the program. And of course, while I was in the program, I felt like I had an advantage already because I was shadowing this trainer. I kind of knew the system, and a couple of, of and, and just really felt like I was a little bit ahead of the curve. With, with the with the obedience for sure, the advanced stuff, uh, not so much. It was that, that was a, it was all new at that point, right? So, um, but it was in, incredibly formal in the sense of. You had your classroom time, you had your uh, hands-on training time, you had your study time, you know, and then you had to find time to, like, work with your own dogs and eat and sleep and all that kind of stuff. So it was pretty jam-packed for six weeks. There was a mid-course exam and a final exam, all in essay format. And um, interestingly enough, got through it, earned, like, eight of the 11 or nine of the 12 um, certifications that you could get. And when I got back into Tucson, uh, the trainer uh, at the time that I was shadowing offered me a job. And and I was already billing, interestingly enough, I forgot to mention this part, I should take a step back, back, but I was, uh, I started walking dogs as I was shadowing this trainer. So as a, I was building up a dog walking clientele and when I got back from the school, uh, I was a certified dog trainer, more or less. Didn't have all the experience, but on paper, right? <laughs> I was certified. And so, um, and not really knowing much about the different like training methodologies and all that kind of stuff. Um, I, you know, I didn't really know what else was out there, but I was doing what I was doing at the time. And, um, and, and so, of course, the dog trainer offered me a job. I jumped on it. It was going to give me an opportunity to kind of like get right to work. I didn't have to worry about like all the startup stuff and website stuff. I had a job. So I jumped on it. And um, and then, uh, you know, it really kind of took off. The, the company itself was relatively young. I was uh, 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 building up a clientele base. I was making people happy. And... One of the things that uh, I really started getting into was this whole socialization thing, right? So there was this little dude on TV. Uh, he was, like, socializing aggressive dogs. And I thought to myself, hey, if, like, this guy can do it, I can do it, right? And so I started trying to emulate that stuff and make it happen. And um, really, it, that really taught me a lot about, like, dog behavior, body signals, cues, all that kind of stuff, right? Um, and, you know, business was thriving. Uh, however, I got to the point where, um, I was ready to kind of go off on my own and, and do my own thing. And so I started up Anthony's Canine Academy and, um, and because of my work with, with the other trainer, uh, and the other company, I was already developing a reputation. I was in with all these rescue groups where it was spreading like wildfire, and people were calling me, and I really didn't even have a website up all the way yet, right? But, of course, figured that stuff out, figured all the the basic type of, like, uh, material in terms of, you know, websites and businesses and search engines and licensing and insurance and all that stuff, right? So we were totally legit, and things just really took off. And this was at the time, so at this time... Craigslist was huge, right? Like ginormous. 
And I took advantage of all that free advertising. And then Facebook was like just taking off as well. And that's a whole nother topic actually. I'm, I kinda, I'm super not happy with their business model right now, but we'll talk about that later. But at the time, totally free advertising, right? And you could start your company. You could have a company page, blah, blah, blah. People following you, liking your page. Word would spread that way too, right? So between Facebook, Craigslist, and the Google with the website and the search engines, it just skyrocketed. Things took off incredibly fast. And within a short time, um, I ended up uh, in a commercial space uh, sharing the space with another trainer, a different trainer. Uh, and, uh, and that stuff was well. And I was really big about, at the time, I was really big about kind of like self-education and, and continuing to, continuing to uh, just educate myself. And along the way, um, I found uh, the Pack to Basics concepts. That was huge for me after, uh, after I... Uh, went out and did the, the weekend uh, workshop with that. I went right home and got right into it. And the reason why is because I was already kind of doing something of that nature in my backyard, just minus the clientele, right? So, you know, it was just me and the dogs, more like dog whisper style or whatnot. And so I had no problem. I was incredibly comfortable bringing this concept home and applying it to uh, my clientele base uh, as a as a free service because I was already dealing a lot with aggression, um, and uh, and it was really in my area in Tucson it was a really it was a new concept altogether no one else was doing it right and um, and so it, that thing took off and as time went on um, there was an opportunity to uh, I, sh I should take a step back. I, I mentioned I found the Pack to Basic concept. I also found another incredible trainer up in Northern California called the Michael Ellis School for Dog Trainers. And I started immersing myself and all that kind of stuff, right? And so along through this process, uh, clientele was just growing and growing and growing. And an opportunity came up uh, to acquire more space on the property that was behind the storefront, the, the, the building. And... In, in all fairness, the building itself was not the most attractive space in the whole wide world, but it was incredibly affordable. And, you know, I was still relatively young at the time, and so I was really treading carefully. But, but when the space came available in the back and for the cost, um, I had to try to, at least I told myself, I had to attempt to try to make... Uh, make it a full business, full-fledged commercial dog training facility that had boarding, that had doggy daycare, that had grooming. And when I mentioned my desire to expand to the, the trainer that I was sharing the space with at the time, uh, they were more or less kind of like um, interested in kind of like not really using the building a whole lot much anymore, right? So the timing of it was really, ended up working out really well. So what happened is I took over full payments, they bowed out, and it was a mutual verbal kind of thing even though both of our names were on the paper. And so I acquired the space in the back, it even had like a little living quarters in it, and um, I did everything I could to try to make it work. We repainted it, we we did all, all of the all of the things that we could do to make it a commercial, usable facility, right? But on that note, it was an incredibly old building, so it certainly had problems. It, it needed repairs and that kind of thing. And I repaired as much as I possibly could. That was my job as a tenant. I did whatever repairs required me as a tenant. I did all those repairs. But after being in the building for a few years, the it, it just started to deteriorate, right? And so um, we 
decided like it wasn't worthwhile staying in there and um but during the time while we were in there uh, we things were kind of, were really good right like we had a nice little reputation we had all these group classes going we had all these private training going we had a little doggy daycare we even brought in a groomer who could cut hair was a phenomenal groomer in terms of like cutting hair and designing all this stuff and um, and I had a couple of trainers with me that were uh, young and in the context of dog training so I was able to kind of share with them you know how I wanted things done and what I liked and they were incredibly easy to work with and so we had a lot of fun I had a lot of fun for sure um, and but unfortunately time passed and the biggest thing that kind of made us decide we needed to get out of there was uh, the the roof was kind of going out right and and when it would rain like especially in monsoon season water would be coming in through the roof right and the way the foundation was laid is like all that water would just come right into the into the middle of the the training center and so that was not good right <laughs> that was not good but the the roof has started to get really bad and moldy and stuff like that and being the fact that it was an old place which which by the way as of this show <laughs> this this broadcast <laughs> that that building's no longer standing right so um but unfortunately we we made the decision to kind of shut down shop and while people had jobs and while we were doing a really um great thing at least i thought we didn't necessarily have the capital to pick up and go find a better looking space and regardless of the space that we found it was going to be a situation where we were going to have to like remodel knock down walls rebuild and we just didn't have the capital to do that and i wasn't interested in trying to get a loan to do so um so I made the really tough choice to shut down the shop, find a, a home to work out of, and that was going to also be really comfortable for my family. So we did that. We shut down shop, um, and we went back to working out of our house, which is something we were doing prior to that. I'm not sure if I mentioned that, but in any case, you know, for the last five or six years or so I've been working out of my house and the setup works really well right I can house the dogs indoors they're air conditioned the yard the yard is nice and spacious it's a brick wall it's like wrought iron gates so it's really um ideal in terms of uh keeping dogs contained right uh, and dogs not escaping so um but I think the biggest thing I really miss about the uh, having that space was offering uh, the socialization classes. Like, I, a dog never got hurt, right? I never had one dog get hurt in those. And I was incredibly proud of that. But I ain't going to lie. It was, it was stressful, right? Like, this class happened on a Saturday, every Saturday. And by the way... Uh, if you go to my website or if, if you uh, check on the YouTube page, there's a, a, a video of this particular class in that building that we were doing. And basically, you'll just see all the, the, the owners, the dog owners, like walking around in a circle, right? And dogs are like following them around. And that's what that class was. And so the, I think the biggest thing that I miss about having a commercial space or workable space, I should say, because I know some folks that can offer this socialization concept like out of their house as well, but but uh, this one I'm in is not ideal for that situation, right? But I know I know of trainers across the country that have that set up and are able to kind of do that thing, and I think that's what I miss the most really about about having the commercial space, um, because you know you can do a group class and you can do private training out in a park in a client's home you can get around that kind of thing but you need a secure space indoor or outdoor but it needs to be secure enough that you can um, 
contain these these dogs because they're all off the leash and you need to be able to contain them to offer this this socialization concept so that's probably the biggest thing I miss um, but you know um, I really at this point in time I'm roughly give or take 10 years in if you include the dog walking and the apprenticing and more or less the the, the time I started training my own dogs, these two knuckleheads that got me in all that trouble, I've been at it for more or less, you know, 10 years or so, give or take. So um, at this point, you know, I, I'm, I'm working out of my house now. I do enjoy it. Um, I enjoy the ability to be around my kids a little bit more as if I had to leave work every day and do a kind of like a nine to five thing. Uh, it's nice to be able to take them to school and pick them up and and uh, just be around, right? I think that's important. Um, and and so we're probably, we don't have any other ambitions at this point of attaining another commercial space. If, if, the, if it does come about in the future and, and the circumstances are good and the circumstances are right, and maybe we'll look into that again. Uh, but at this point, we're pretty happy and comfortable with uh, where we are and what we're doing. And I think we're still offering a great service to the community. I mean, it's fair to say that I'm one of the few dog trainers in town that will touch aggression cases and and that kind of thing. And it's really what we've kind of built our name and, and our model on. So um, I'm still happy to be offering uh, a service that is in, in, in high demand for sure. Um, but yeah, man, I think that's more or less... Uh, my story and my journey, um, you know, uh, a little bit has to do with these two in the back, and so I thought it was only proper that I have them um, uh, on the show, so you guys can, uh, so you guys know who they are. And I'm excited about uh, uh, continuing to just help the community in, in the way that I do. Um, for sure miss the um, socialization class that I used to be able to offer, but I'm, st I'm still totally content with what I'm doing. If the opportunity ever presents itself in the future to uh, do that again, um, I'll definitely be all over it. Um, it was a very unique um, niche type of service, right? Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, we're running out of time now, probably. Um, I think uh, I don't have much else to really share in terms of my experience and how I got here. And, uh, and I thought, you know, maybe there's a, 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 a fan base out there that may, that's interested in this and, and how I got started in dog training. And interestingly enough, uh, if you ask around enough, <laughs> you'll find that uh, a lot of dog trainers actually started this way, right? They had a problem with a dog, found a dog trainer, became passionate about it, about what they didn't know. And I think that was incredibly huge for myself. I was blown away by how much I didn't actually know. So I almost felt like a, this like religious kind of like guy that was running around like spreading the gospel about dogs and dog, dog training and how they learn. And, you know, even to this day, of course, I've been doing it for a long time, so I see it over and over again. But um, there, the, there's a lot of dog owners out there that just don't really understand the animals. It's just a, it's just a conditioned kind of mentality um, on our part th that dogs are just, you know, um, animals that we have as pets and all, all the time. And so we go out and we acquire them without necessarily really understanding the animal at a, at a, at a level that's going to allow us to live with them coherently and, um, and, you know, prevent them from, from getting themselves in trouble. You know, dogs don't really know that their behavior can get them in trouble. They don't know it can get us in trouble. And so, 
you know, I think it's just like anything else in the world. It's a, it's a little bit about education and, and sharing that information and, and empowerment. My biggest thing is I'm looking to empower um, that average dog owner. And that's really what this show is about going forward. This show is really designed for that average dog owner. You know, a lot of people these days, especially with the Internet, they're... And this is one of, even myself, like right now, doing this this show, I did all the research and the self-help kind of um, research to be able to start doing this show, right? And so there are definitely people out there that are looking for a little bit of self-help. They're looking online for information. And that's the whole purpose of this show is to provide as much information as I possibly can about dog training and of uh, a variety of dog topics that that may help someone out. So that's all I have. I uh, I can probably ramble a little bit more. I have a strong tendency to repeat myself. So if you notice that, <laughs> I do apologize. But uh, we're excited to be here. Uh, I'm excited to bring you this content, and I hope you guys like it. Outside of that, I think I'm done for now. We'll talk to you next time. Thanks for watching our video. If you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe down below. And if you're interested in receiving future content, be sure to turn on the notifications button. Also, share the video. You never know who it may help. Until next time, I'm out of here.